Good morning. It's uh, great to be with you. It's lovely, isn't it, having this wonderful summer weather at last. Feels a little bit more relaxed and a little bit more warm. Um, it's great. If you want to take a seat, we're going to be looking at the Bible in a moment. We're going to be looking at a passage in Exodus. <clears throat> so if you've got a Bible, you may want to turn to Exodus chapter 34. If you don't have a Bible and you want to follow along, then there's some on the windowsills at the side. Um, you can grab one of those or ask someone to pass you one. So Exodus chapter 34, if you want to start to um, look at that passage. And I want to be looking at example of Moses and how he didn't second, settle for second best. Now, Alex Diaz, are you here this morning? He's downstairs. Oh, how disappointing. <laughs> so for those of you who weren't here last week, I do feel really sorry for Alex. He was really picked on about his plant keeping skills, wasn't he, last week? That you've, been, you've been commissioned to look after friends' plants, haven't you? Susanna is, is here. Are they, are they alive still, or are they dead yet? Okay, good. Well done. Congratulations. But I th- There you are, you see. Well, I've got a solution for you this week, for you and Alex. This is the solution, an artificial plant. There you go. Okay. So I thought this, to, to help you, you faced such ridicule last week, and I thought, to help you, let me give you a helpful suggestion Artificial plants are the way to go. Okay, so when your friends come back, your plants will still be alive. Or they'll look alive anyway. Okay, but I just thought, it's great, isn't it? Okay, like you're saying, you were learning this morning how to look after plants, how to care for them, because they need water, by the way. Okay, they need light as well, but maybe not too much light. They need a bit of fertilizer. And they need to be looked after, lovingly and caringly spoken to. Um, otherwise, they will die. But here is the solution, the artificial plant. Okay? It makes life easy for you, doesn't it? You don't have to worry about when do I water it, when do I feed it, where's the best place to put it. You don't have to worry about all those things. It makes life so much easier, the artificial plant. But is it as good as the real thing? It makes life easy for you. You don't have to worry about it. It's there all the time, isn't it? It just looks great in the corner. You don't have to worry about it. Life is easy when you have an artificial plant. But you're right, it's not like the real thing, is it? It doesn't offer any fragrance. It doesn't smell. It doesn't grow. It doesn't do what plants do, which is turn carbon dioxide into life-giving oxygen. It doesn't multiply. It can't produce seeds that can go on and produce more flowers. But it makes life easier. And sometimes that can be the case, can't it? We, We settle for the second best. It looks good. It fulfills a purpose. It actually makes our life easier. But it's not the real thing. It's second best. And and we can so often slip into thinking that is the best thing. It makes my life easier. I don't have to worry about looking after it. I don't have to worry about caring for it. I can just sit back and let it stand in the corner and it's still there. When my friends come back from holiday, the plants will still be there. um, And I won't have had all that stress and worry about trying to keep it alive while they were away. So there we go. There's your, there's your solution. Um, you can go away and think about that if you like. Um, I'd love to offer it to you, but it's not actually mine to give. So, oh, sorry about that. Um, and what I want to talk about today is this not settling for second best. Because the danger is that we, could, we can do the same as Christians for those who follow Jesus. We can settle for a second best life. I'm happy with where I am. I feel comfortable I know the people in my church. I can speak to them. I have good conversations with them. I know the songs. I know that they're going to, when I sing the songs, they, I, I feel good about the songs. They make me feel nice. 
I know that I can go and get some good teaching when I want it just to make me feel good. And there can be, there can be that in, in the church, can't there? It can look good. It can look like things are going well. We could have good songs. We could have accomplished musicians, which we do. We could, we could have all the functions that externally look like a church. But we could miss out on the very presence of God because we're not contending for the presence of God. We can sit back and settle for second best because sometimes that's, a bit, that's easy for us to just come along, to attend, to come to the things that happen and just to be there and sit there without really contending and without really seeking the presence of God in all these things. And I want to take a look at a moment in Moses' life when he could have taken second best. And what he did in response to God's revelation of who he is, of who God is. And how Moses contended for the presence of God. He didn't settle for second best. So I don't know if you know the story of Moses in the Bible. He was an extraordinary man, really, if you know his story. Some of you might have seen the king of Egypt. Some of you might have seen various... Um, shows about Moses, films about Moses, you might have an understanding. He was an extraordinary man. God took him from a place of slavery in Egypt. He raised him up to be a leader of, 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 the, of God's people. Um, he, he actually was around when God did incredible things in Egypt, sent lots of plagues to, sh- to demonstrate God's power. He was around. He was the one who spoke to Pharaoh at the time about what was going to happen. He was the one who negotiated with Pharaoh about setting God's people free to go and worship God in the new land that God was going to give to them. He was an extraordinary character, was Moses. He knew God. He'd been, he'd been spoken to by God. He'd met him in a, a flaming bush on a mountain. And, and he'd, he'd led the people of Israel through <laughs> the Dead Sea as it parted. As, as God parted the waves when they were facing complete annihilation by Egypt. Moses led the people through this incredible salvation moment that God provided. And Moses had seen all this. And Moses, at this point we're coming to, he'd gone up a mountain to be with God in God's presence. God had spoken to him almost face to face. God had described to him what what God was going to do to to allow his presence to live with Moses and the people. He'd laid out this wonderful plan of salvation to Moses while Moses was with God on the mountain, face to face. Moses was this extraordinary life up to this point. But then what had happened, Moses came back down from the mountain, having been with God, having experienced this wonderful moment and bringing this really good news on some stone tablets to tell the people what God was going to do and how God was going to be present with his people. And what does he find when he comes down from the mountain? The people have rejected God. They've taken all the provisions that God had given them from Egypt, gold and everything that they've been given. They'd thrown it into a fire. And they'd asked Aaron, Moses' second in command, to create an idol for them. And out of it comes a golden calf. All the possessions and, and gifts that God had given them from Egypt to go and be in the promised land, the people had transformed it into a golden calf to worship. And Moses comes down from the mountain with this wonderful news of God, that God is going to be with his people. This is how it's going to work. This is how it's going to happen. And he finds them worshipping a golden calf. He finds them completely rejected. And what does he do? He takes these wonderful words of God and he smashes them on the ground. The tablets he brought down the words that God has said, I I'm, I'm promised that I was going to be with you, these promises, Moses, in exasperation, throws them down. And in this moment, I think Moses is a broken man. Yeah? His leadership's broken. People have just rejected him, not, not, not obeyed what he said. He's gone away for a period, and they've just completely rejected him and his words. He's literally broken the words of God. He's sort of like smashed them on the ground. His exasperation. I think Moses is a broken man at this point. He's a broken man. Everything that he was, you know, he comes down with this wonderful expectation of God's presence going with the people, and he finds them reveling in an idol, and he just loses it. And he becomes, I just, as I say, I think he becomes a broken man at this point. And 
<coughs> excuse me, and, and God, in response to this, says to Moses, he says in verse uh, 2 to 3 of Exodus 33, in response to this, in response to the people's rejection of God, God says, I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you, because you are a stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you on the way. This was Moses' moment to settle for second best. Yes, they could still go to the promised land flowing with milk and honey that God had promised. Yes, God would, would, would make a way for them to go into the promised land and, and drive out their enemies ahead of them. But God wasn't going to go with them. God was going to send an angel instead. An angel's a pretty good thing, I would imagine. You read about some of the angels in the Bible, they're pretty powerful. You know, they're, they're, they're pretty glorious in their appearance at times. You would have thought, great, okay, an angel's going with us. And we're still going to defeat enemies. We're still going to take hold of the land. We're still going to be in a place that's flowing with land and milk and honey. We're still going to possess that, but God's not going to be with us. And Moses, this is the moment in Moses' life where he could have settled for that. He could have said, yes, no, you're right, God. You're right in your actions to do this. People are a stiff-necked people, as you've said. Quite right that you wouldn't want to go with us. Because you are a holy God. And you might just destroy us. But yes, send an angel. Send an angel. I'm happy to go with an angel. Moses doesn't. Moses, at this point, he's come to understand the need of God's empowering presence. He said he's had an extraordinary life. He's seen miraculous things happen in terms of God releasing people from Egypt. He's seen miraculous provision as well on the way to where they're, where they're, where they're at at the moment. Food provided, water springing from rocks, extraordinary things. He knows what the presence of God is like. And he, having been stripped of all his self-sufficiency, because he was a shepherd, he had to leave, and because he killed a man in Egypt, he had to leave for a period. And in his self-sufficiency, um, he's he'd been stripped of all this self-sufficiency, taking care of sheep. He met with the presence of God, as I said, in the burning bush. And in his weakness, and by God's power, he'd seen the people come out of slavery. He'd known the power of God. And having lost it all, having come to this moment of brokenness, most, Moses truly knew the difference that having or not having God would make. He knew that that was the case. He wasn't prepared to settle for second best. And so what does he do? In Exodus chapter 34, from verse 4, this is what happens. Moses had God had commanded Moses to come again to the mountain, bringing with him two more tablets. He says, I'm going to meet with you. So Moses, it said from verse 4, Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first. And he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hands two, tone stacks, two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. And he said, If now I have found favour in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us. For it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us your inheritance. Moses wasn't prepared to settle for second best. He pleaded with God. He said, no, please don't leave us. Don't just give us your angel. We need your presence. Moses did not accept second best. 
For Moses, an angel to lead them was not acceptable. He wanted to be led by God. Why was the genuine presence of God so important to Moses? We've explained about his, his experience. And why do we need to contend for the genuine presence of God? I think this passage tells us two things. One is because, because of who we are and because of who God is. Because of who we are, we need the real presence of a loving, merciful, just God. Moses recognized that. That's why he said, you've got to go with us, God. Why? Because he says, we're a stiff-necked people. We are a stiff-necked people. I recognize that. We are sinful. We are rebellious. That's our nature. But because of that nature, we need the God who's just revealed himself to me to go with us. An angel won't do, because an angel is not a loving, compassionate, merciful, forgiving God, as God has just revealed himself to be to Moses. Moses has spoken, so God has spoken to Moses again. The first thing he says to Moses when Moses comes up the mountain again is it, God says who he is. God says who he is. And in, in response to what God says, Moses says, please go with us. Because I know we are a sinful people. I know we deserve justice. I know we deserve for you not to go with us. But because of that, Lord, we need you to go with us. Because we need someone who loves and forgives. Someone who is merciful. Someone whose steadfast love, as God has just said, will be with us forever. From generation to generation. But we also need to know that there is a God who is just and holy and righteous. As God has just said. That I will contend against sin. I can't because I'm a holy God, so there must be a way of dealing with it. And this is the God who, who we need. Moses cries to God for his genuine presence because he knows the sinfulness of the people. He knows his own rebelliousness. He knows his own need and dependence for God. And he knows the need for the people for God. He knows that now he just experienced it. While he was away, they naturally turned back to worshipping false idols and false gods. They'd, second, they'd settle for second best because they hadn't heard from God for a while. They hadn't heard from Moses for a while. So they'd settle for second best. Moses said, because people are like that, these people are like that, I know that they will continue to do this. We need you to go with us, God. Please don't abandon us. Please don't just send an angel. But we need your presence. Why? Because we need the presence of this loving, merciful God. God says, <coughs> I am a God a merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. An angel wouldn't be able to do that. An angel wasn't in a position to offer that. God had laid out how he was going to forgive his people and live with them through the commandments to Moses that he'd, just, that he'd given and he was about to give again. So, Moses knew he needed God's presence with him. He knew he needed the genuine mercy and presence of God. The world around us today needs to hear the genuine voice of God again. This declaration, this revelation of who God is that Moses had at the moment he contended for God's presence. The world needs to hear and the world needs to see the genuine voice of God. Why? Because like us, who've been saved into, into wonderful re relationship with God through Jesus, we know his forgiveness because we were sinful and stiff-necked. And we know the world is sinful and stiff-necked. They need to know that there is a God who sees injustice and acts against it. We recently heard this week of um, a person in a, an area in Pakistan who had um, been taken into a police station um, because they had supposedly desecrated the Quran. And in response, a mob had been raised and they raided the police station, they dragged this person out of the police station and they beat and killed this person publicly. And they then went back and destroyed the police station. Um, and, and now, in that situation, we, ha we know people who are 
who know and love Jesus, who live in that sort of area. What, what a wonderful thing to know, isn't it, that God sees these things. God sees the injustice. God sees when things um, are done that are not right. We need, we need to know that God is there, don't we, in those situations. We need to know that God is going to act. We need to know that God is going to deal with those things. Because without that, we'd just be hopeless, wouldn't we? We wouldn't have hope. And knowing this genuine presence of God is so important. But also in that, there's the God who loves and forgives. So we know that even at those moments, if, if, if people turn and, and repent and come to God and turn to Jesus, they would find forgiveness for what they'd just done. That's the incredible thing. That is the amazing thing. That's the genuine presence of God. And we need to be contending for that. We need to be contending for the genuine presence of God. We need to be contending for the genuine gospel. And not settling for second best. Not settling back for an easy life. Not thinking, oh, just because we, things are really good, just because things look nice, the plant looks nice, it's there, I don't have to, do, I don't have to worry about it, I don't have to worry too much about how it's going to survive, I don't have to battle to keep it alive, because it just is there, and I can just sit back and have an easy life. And when we need to contend with the presence of God, because there's a danger, there's a danger that we can just sit back, there's a danger that we can just think, things are looking good, they're okay. So I personally don't need to worry about the presence of God. I don't need to worry about um, working, working in God's presence. I don't need to be working for the gospel and helping people to come and understand God because I'm okay. It's all right for me. I just sit back. But the world needs to hear this genuine voice of God. We need to contend for the genuine presence of God in our personal life, in, the family, in our family life of church. Worship. Moses, it says immediately, Moses quickly in the presence of God. Let us come into a setting like this, in our own personal lives maybe, when we're at home worshipping God. Let it not be a daily chore, I think, oh, I must read my Bible. I must spend time in prayer and just tick it off my list. Because, oh, it's done, I've done it, that's okay. Oh, I came to church on Sunday. I sang a few songs and I went away without understanding that actually we're wanting the genuine presence of God to be in this. We're seeking God in all of this. Is our worship done in an awareness that God is present? When we come, it's not just singing songs. We're coming like Moses and bowing before the presence of God, who's declared himself to be this loving, just, righteous God. And we come and we bow down in worship, expecting him to be here, knowing he's with us. Because Jesus has promised to be with us by his Holy Spirit, living actually in us. In our prayer life, is our prayer life done in an awareness that God is present with us? Or is it just, oh, I'm going to pray for a few people who are sick um, and hopefully, hopefully they'll get better. Or when we're praying, do we really pray that the presence of God is there and that God is listening and God is hearing and this God who is acting and acts with justice and mercy and kindness. It's present when we pray. It's present to us. And also we need to be contending for faith and obedience to the gospel. As I said, the world needs to know the real God, the true God. The God who is a God of justice. But the God who has dealt with justice in a way that is loving and merciful and compassionate. And what is that way he's done with it? Through his own son, Jesus Christ. Through Jesus taking the punishment for our guilt and our sin on himself. So God has dealt with sin. God has dealt with it. And Jesus is the one who's going to judge. Jesus is the one who's going to return, it says, and judge all people. But he's also provided a way to know and love God. Jesus is God's very presence with us. He was with his disciples. He showed and revealed God to be who he is. He showed the demonstration of God's justice by being punished for sin on the cross, as we know. And he loved us so much by taking that punishment for us. So that anyone who believes and trusts and follows Jesus will be forgiven, will have their sins forgiven, 
Because God's, the first words of God's to Moses are, he is gracious and compassionate, loving and steadfast. Thousands and thousands of generations, forgiving iniquity and sin. And he's done it in Jesus. We don't want to settle for a wishy-washy gospel that just loves everybody because it sounds nice to people and doesn't require us to grapple with the truth that God punishes sin and that he is holy. The world needs a holy God. The world needs a holy God to know that God is acting justly and wisely, that he is unlike anything and anybody else in the world. Not the genuine gospel because it doesn't include the justice of God. And we can't just settle for the punishment of God and talk about hell and destruction and the need to repent because it doesn't require us to grapple with how to love people and practice genuine forgiveness. So we can settle for those different sides because they're easy for us sometimes. They don't mean we need to contend for God's presence. They don't mean we need to contend the true God and who he is. But the genuine gospel, the culmination of God's justice and punishment and his love and forgiveness, we know is fully realized in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus satisfies the justice of God against sin. And no matter how far away you think you are from God or how corrupt and shameful you feel you may be, Jesus has paid the penalty for you. Jesus has paid the penalty to you. Jesus was the very presence of God. We must never settle for second best. I'm going to ask the band to come up. We're going to respond, I think, in worship to this revelation of who God is. But we must contend to be in a place where we're constantly looking for him, for our salvation, our future, and our purpose now. And to be ready to share him with those who don't yet know him. Moses was a broken man. He, he, could, he could have settled for second best. But he obeyed God. And he got up early in the morning. He made space and time to hear from God. He was prepared to listen to God. He was prepared with the tablets to write down what God had said. So that he would have them, those God's words with him again. He prepared. He he. he He made time and space to listen to God. He made time and space for God to reveal himself in the words that God said to him, that he is the God who loves and he is the God who's holy and just. So we need to be, if we want to contend for the very presence of God, if we want to contend for for, for the gospel, if we want to contend to be people who share this good news of God with others, we need to know God ourselves. We need to be putting ourselves in the place where Moses was, in a, in a place of readiness and expectation that God is going to speak. Let's make time. Let's not second for settle, but second, settle for second best, thinking, oh, it's all okay. But let's put ourselves in a place like Moses. If it needs be, let us get up early in the morning to be in a place where we can hear God. If necessary, let's get a notebook to write down as we read the Bible and as we pray that with the expectation that God is going to speak to us because God is present and we need to be in the place to hear from him for our sake but for the sake of the world who needs to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's stand together. We're going to worship Moses' response, as I said, to what God had said, how God revealed himself, was to quickly bow down and acknowledge and say and pray to God. Say, God, I need you. God, we need you. I'm a stiff-necked person. We are stiff-necked people. The world around us is a stiff-necked people. Lord, we want to worship you. We want to ask God for your presence. We want to say, Lord, stir us. Holy Spirit. Stir us again. Stir us for the again for the need to be to seek you come and help us Lord be those that contend for your true presence Amen